thank you for the introduction to this. Um, uh, what you see behind me is the cover of my new popular science book that's coming out later this year, but I also have a more technical book. I'll show you a slide at, at about those at the very, very end. Now, um, before we start, I should tell you who I am so that you know what to expect. Um, so basically, who I am is that I finished high school despite almost failing at maths, and I was extremely bad at maths, and I hated it. Um, these days, I've gotten, I, I've sort of made peace with most of mathematics. I'm still not good at it, but we accept each other now. Um, so, um, and because I was so bad at maths, and because I wanted to understand the mind, I started studying philosophy and psychology, because that must be the way to understand the mind. What is intelligence? Where, do, where does consciousness come from? These, these kind of questions. And after a while, I sort of realized that I wasn't really getting anywhere. I mean, the problems just seem more unsolvable than ever. So I, in order to build a mind, in order to understand a mind, I needed to build one. So I gradually segued over into computer science so I could study artificial intelligence. And I went to England to study artificial life and adaptive systems at the University of Sussex so I could, um, so I could understand, so, so I could take that perspective. And then I did my PhD um, at the University of Essex in, uh, well, I changed sex, basically. So, um, uh, and I thought I was going to use evolutionary algorithms to evolve neural networks for robots. That was what I started doing, robots that could teach themselves to, uh, to act in the world. But then I realized that robots are very slow and expensive and clunky and they fall apart and you need to basically um, uh, refill the oil, change tires, um, um, charge the batteries, and these sort of things. And that was very boring, and I didn't want to do all of that. And in general, I think the physical world is mostly a nuisance. So I um, decided that you could do all these experiments inside games, use games as AI test beds. And I thought that was really interesting. And it was. It was really cool. And that really got me going. Um, but then, at some point during this, I realized that... Um, not only can you use um, games to test and develop AI, you can also use AI to make games better. Um, and so that's what I've been doing, both of these things essentially, first in England and Denmark and now in the US. Let's get to some content. So basically, artificial intelligence. Um, this is, as you can see, this is from the movie 2001, maybe one of the world's best movies. Um, Probably is. Um, you, sh you should watch it. It has this uh, main, the main protagonist in a sense is this AI that um, takes its mission a little bit too literally to the um, uh, detriment of several other people. And it's pretty dark. It's a pretty dark picture. Let's give you a lighter picture. Artificial intelligence. What is it? I think of it as making computers able to do things which currently only humans can do or which currently humans do much better. This is a very boring, pragmatic definition. We're very far from these wild philosophical dreams, but I think it's extremely useful. Let's talk about this as artificial intelligence, and let's think about games. What do humans do with games? Huh? They learn to get better at games? Good. What more do humans do with games? Have fun. They make decisions. They win. They cheat. <laughs> it's good, good. Yeah, now we're getting somewhere. Hmm? Anything else people do with games? Emulate different environments, like things are not games, yeah. So to help you, to help you, I already have it. This is like cooking TV. I already, I already made the, the answers for you. So almost every audience I give, I have posed this question, with the exception of maybe two or three, you're one of them, start with someone answering playing games. It just like comes automatically. You say games, I say play. No, I say games, you say play. Um, and that's what happens. But of course, you have people who study games. I have lots of colleagues in game studies that um, study games like people who study literature or movies or um, ancient text or something like this. People explain games to others, teach, teach people how to play games. 
build content for them. You go online, you see so many levels and maps and so on for StarCraft and um, um, Little Big Planet, Minecraft, all these sort of games where people can build content for them. Um, and of course, design and develop games, which is a major, um, which is a major sort of activity, major economic activity. Um, and my take on this is that AI, traditionally, we're talking about people using AI to play games. And we're gonna talk about that very soon. But um, actually, it's at least as interesting to use AI in all of these other roles. And uh, you can find new interesting problems that people haven't studied very much. But let's go back to playing games. Humans play games because games are designed to challenge our minds. The main reason, or one of the main reasons games are fun, is that they are designed so that we learn to play them as we play them. You start a new game, you don't know what to do, and you relatively quickly, quickly get the main bearings of it. Um, and then as you go on playing it, you get better and better and better at it. You have this long, smooth learning curve. And that's a main factor for what, we, what makes games so appealing. This idea is mine, it comes from different sources. It comes from machine learning, it comes from um, game design theory. Raf Koster, for example, famous game designer, has written a book called A Theory of Fun, which is really basically this theory. And from uh, developmental psychologists like Piaget and Vygotsky and so on, who have basically stated this in various ways. Um, and that's why games are so great for AI as well, because they are made, well-designed game is essentially a long-form teaching tool slash intelligence test. And the fact that games are so different means that mean that they cover a large, as um, a very large sort of catalog of different cognitive abilities we humans have. So at the very beginning of AI, back when the world wasn't black and white, and the computer was the, si was the size of a room, um, uh, people used chess as like the archetypical AI problem. This is John McCarthy, one of the um, founders of um, AI's discipline, um, uh, playing chess against a room the size of a computer. No, a computer the size of a room. Um, I don't know whether he won or lost. But people were like really working on chess for a long time because it was seen to embody everything you need about intelligence. You have this long-term planning about the, and you and you have to take an adversary into account. You have to figure out what the other person is thinking and how to outsmart them. And then this happened. Fast forward to 1997. Um, computers were not the size of rooms, but they were very ugly. Um, and this is IBM's Deep Blue computer, um, represented by some kind of faceless IBM person, winning over Garry Kasparov, the reigning world champion of chess. And this was a huge public event. And what does this mean? Had we solved artificial intelligence? Or um, what happened? Um, no, because you, op you looked at this, what Deep Blue did, and it was essentially just a search algorithm. It was a minimax algorithm. And people were a little bit disappointed. Also, Deep Blue couldn't do anything else than play uh, chess. It couldn't play checkers. It couldn't play um, Super Mario Bros. It couldn't tie its shoelaces, couldn't write a love poem, unless you reprogrammed it. Maybe chess was the wrong game. Maybe we need to look at some other game. So 2016, this happened. This is uh, DeepMind, then a division of Google, um, their AlphaGo software, defeating the reigning um, champion, or one of the reigning champions of Go. Go, which you probably know, is the sort of Asian equivalent of chess. Um, um, but it has a number of features which makes it harder for AI. It's a higher branching factor, um, so by many more moves can be taken. It's harder to evaluate how good the board is. And with that, games were done. We had had software, um, we had designed software that could beat humans, the best humans at all the classic board games. Okay, AI is done, fine. But it turns out that AI applied to games is so much more um, than playing board games. And in fact, board games, the classical board games, represent a very, very small um, subset of the problem space of, um, of games. Let's look at video games. These are three games that have been used very frequently in, um, in AI competitions at some of the main 
um, AI in games conferences, like computational intelligence in games, and foundations of digital games, and so on. This, as you probably recognize, is um, South Korea's national sport, StarCraft. It's a, <laughs> it's a game that uh, was released in 1999, I think, by Blizzard. Um, it's somewhat, it's finally losing popularity a little bit, but it's been a, it's been a very, very, very long run. And it's, um, um, it's extremely hard, it has an extreme depth, and in South Korea in particular, the biggest StarCraft players are like national stars that play in, in front of sold out stadiums, or at sold out stadiums. This here is a version of Super Mario Bros, which needs no introduction, you all have played Super Mario Bros um, at some point, or some version of it. Um, and here is a pretty generic looking three-dimensional racing game from Torx, which have also, um, has also been used um, in, uh, in these competitions. I bring them up because um, they test human cognitive capacities in very different ways. And they, have ve they pose very different demands. Let's look at one of them. So back in 2009, um, when I was still working in Switzerland, actually, um, I found this, um, uh, maybe I found it in 2008, this um, open source re-implementation of Super Mario Bros. called Infinite Mario Bros. Um, originally made by Notch, the guy who later became famous by, for making Minecraft. But back then he wasn't famous, he was still answering emails. Um, and uh, uh, me and one of uh, my students back then, a master student of mine, we, we built this into an AI benchmark. Um, where people, um, and we created a competition based on this, where people would submit the best um, Mario playing algorithms and we would test them. It had level generation going on and we, um, and then we would basically, the one who finished the most different new levels would win the competition. We thought we had a great competition. Then, then this thing happens. And this is both awesome and made us a little bit sad because just a few weeks before the end of the competition, Robin Baumgarten, then at Imperial College in London, now uh, a successful indie game designer that designs very weird games, submitted this agent. And as you can see, I love showing this video because you're all like hypnotized. You, you, wa you watch this video and like, whoa, it's jumping at the very last edge of, of every platform. And is every movie so perfect? How can you do this? And there are things which you definitely cannot do as a human, which are like basically beyond, beyond anyone's capabilities, such as, for example, <laughs> you can't do that. So we were sad. We were, we were saddened because we thought we had a really good AI benchmark, and then this thing happens. This guy just comes and like seems to play this entirely um, um, uh, perfectly. So we um, created um, a new version of the benchmark. Um, yeah, okay, okay, there's one important thing here. This one simple trick. Do you know what kind of uh, algorithm this is? So who here thinks that this is like a neural network? No one. Who here thinks there's like some kind of machine learning involved? Okay, I'm, I'm posing the question the wrong way. <laughs> this, is, um, this is an A star algorithm. That, y that searches in state space. So it has an internal simulation of the game and, it's, uh, and, and, it, and it tries to get to the right end of the screen or at any time. And it's ridiculously simple and it's ridiculously effective. So we thought that how we could possibly, um, how we could possibly sort of um, make life harder for A-star algorithms. So we created these um, levels with overhangs here. So this is, um, a dead end, and you need to basically move back up here, jump up on top of this ledge to win, and the A-star algorithm just can't search that far. It's sort of, if you were to visualize this line, it's like searching around all the time here. Maybe there's a way out of here. And he plays like amazing mac micro, but extremely bad macro. So you have him dancing around here, doing his little routine, and uh, not getting anywhere at all. So we were quite happy about this. We were sort of, how we sort of thwarted this simple execution. And what happened in the, what happened in that next year, we had um, a, um, a winner of the competition in 2010, which is still the best Mario playing agent I know of, which uses A-star to navigate at a lower level. See what he did there? Um, um, 
and to create like um, a use a star to navigate at a lower level. Um, and then it has a number of rules that decide which parts of the screen to go to depending on where it's been in the past. Um, and uh, these rules are evolved using an evolutionary algorithm. So it's uh, for like AI purists, this is a Frankenstein's monster of a solution. It's like uh, we're we, we basically sort of, you know, stacking these things on top of each other. But it's really good. And this demonstrates a few things. Like what one thing is demonstrated is what, what seems like the same game can be very, very different depending on how you present it. And um, it also demonstrates that the winning solution is often like um, an ugly combination of different things. Since then, um, there's been a lot of game-based AI benchmarks based on a large variety of games, and some of them have been used for very high-profile publications in nature and so on. And this is like, it's become more and more accepted that games are some of the, especially video games, are some of the absolutely best benchmarks for AI, because they're fast, they challenge your mind in different ways, and so on and so on. And in particular, it's been very popular to use um, a form of reinforcement learning called deep reinforcement learning algorithms um, with deep nets, so big, large neural networks, to play these games. In so that some people would claim that this is like definitely the way you should play games. You should use deep networks and training with reinforcement learning. However, that's just your opinion. Um, um, by the way, I, I, this is another one of the world's best movies. Um, 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 and um, in fact, deep reinforcement learning um, has its uses, but it really depends how you present um, the problem to the, um, 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 to the algorithm. Looking at this, how can you play a game? Um, you can play a game in many different ways. If you have a forward model, so you can simulate what happens in, um, uh, in front of you, and it's a fast forward model, so you know, if I take this action, this happens. Then you can use lots of different planning approaches. You can use uninformed search, basic breadth first, depth first search, and so on. You can use informed search, A star, and I would probably classify and put Monte Carlo tree search, which is the main engine behind the AlphaGo program as well, into a form of informed search. You can use evolutionary algorithms um, um, to, for planning as well. If you do not have a forward model, but you have training time, so you have lots of time to train, train a model to play your games, you can use um, algorithms from the approximate dynamic pro programming family of algorithms, such as PD learning. And Q learning, deep Q learning in particular, is one form of algorithm from this family. They basically try to, uh, to update, gradually learn value functions for states or state action pairs. But you can also use evolutionary algorithms. Note he here how evolutionary algorithms are used in very, very different forms for planning and for learning hypotheses which is often overlooked, but they're extremely powerful in both ways. You can also, if you don't have any of these, but you have play traces, so you have humans that have, that have played a game, or something else that played a game, you can use supervised learning. Um, neural nets, k-nears, neighbors, SVMs, whatever you have. And these things can be combined. Or you can introduce random algorithms, uh, and you can expand this list with the things like um, what's used in the game industry, which is essentially hand or things like the Hayden trees. Um, I like showing this thing because it's very often that people come to the task of playing games and only have one of these perspectives. However, there's a problem. Whether you construct your algorithm to play a game manually or you learn it, you're over 50. And what we saw, I've been part of running a whole bunch of these um, uh, game-based AI competitions. And what we've seen time after time again is that in the beginning, people optimistically throw some really general solution at this game and tries and, and, and tries to make it work, and it works so-so. But then as the competition goes on, people sort of specialize the solutions more and more and more, and we get extremely sort of, you, you basically, domain engineering wins over AI. And in the end, like, car racing competition, it ran for like, I was part of starting this thing, and it ran for like uh, seven years. And in the end, these, uh, these solutions were really boring. They drove extremely well, at least in the particular types of tracks we used and when there would be not many other cars around. But they were like, um, eh. um, I mean, what kind of AI do we got here? Um, 
we were not really making any progress on general AI. So what can we do? Okay, now I'm gonna show you something. This is not appropriate for all, all audiences. I'm sorry, I don't like having these things on slides. Um, I hope you're not offended, but I'm gonna show you an equation. I really don't think equations belong on slides, but it's a good one. Um, this is uh, Shane Legg, um, who worked at IDSIA back when I was there, and at Breezy, I guess, when you were still in the next one, yeah. Um, who went later on went on to fund the deep mind. He, his theory of universal intelligence. His theory of universal intelligence, of a policy pie, say an agent, is how well this agent performs over all possible environments. It gets a reward weighted by the inverse complexity of the environment. So basically, his theory is, is homogeneous complexity of the environment. So how, how intelligent am I or you? Well, it's easy. We, we, we test how good we are at all, all possible tasks, and then we weigh those that are can, can, can be described in a simple way higher. This is very clever because it sort of avoids the original formulation of the um, uh, no free lunch theorem, at least. Um, and it also it intuitively makes sense that the easy to describe problems are sort of more fundamental in a way. However, it has two problems. One, one problem is that all possible environments will take forever to um, uh, try. I mean, uh, I mean so it's imp impractical. Also, Kolmogorov complexity is incomputable. So you can say it's a little bit impractical, this measure. But it's more like, I more see this as intuition for the idea that what if we had AI that could play not one game, but many different games, especially if they're different from each other, require different things from you. So if we had a test where we'd people construct agents and there was an interface where we can let them play games that, that people, the people who constructed the agent didn't even know about, that would be more like an actual intelligence test, right? So with this in mind, we um, created the general video game playing competition. In the original version of this, we now have a number of different tracks. It works like this. Competitors submit um, controllers. These are like little AI programs. In the original formulation, this is written in Java. Um, and the game engine let these controllers play a number of unseen games and scores the controllers. And we wrote a complete language for expressing these games, which would also make it easy to generate games, etc. cetera. Um, this is not part of what I'm talking about today, but there's a whole lot of infrastructure here. So we have things like, the, here's a version of the overworld in The Legend of Zelda. Um, and what we have here is um, a human playing this game. You kill spiders, pick up keys, um, uh, get to the door. Um, you have to have picked up the key to unlock the door and you win, it's brilliant. Congratulations. Um, here is a random agent playing Zelda. It moves randomly, it dies, not surprising. Um, so what can actually play these games well? Well, in the original formulation, we give them a fast forward model. And remember the slide ahead, well, then you can try various planning algorithms. Among them, Monte Carlo Tree Search, which is, again, it was invented in 2006, 2007 for um, playing Go, and it has later on been shown to be incredibly useful in general. Um, and it, it um, it's a stochastic planning algorithm that builds unbalanced trees um, uh, a, and can actually really sort of, um, um, and, 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 and it has really good performance even when you don't know what the problem is in many cases. Here's a version of Monte Carlo Tree Search playing Zelda, being really good at killing these spiders and then a little bit absent-minded, like where was I going with this key? Um, I, these rollouts aren't reaching far enough. I can't reach to the end of the screen. And oh, there it goes. Good, good, we win. Very, very, very good. Here's another game. Um, uh, it's a version of Space Invaders. Um, you um, have to shoot the invading aliens and then, you know, you um, win. Or if the aliens get you, you lose. It's uh, um, not a very interesting game, but it's a different challenge. 
Um, are you, is Nina playing it fairly well? Here's a random player doing um, playing, playing randomly, which might look like initially is not playing that bad, but um, as you see, he can't avoid these bombs at all. And this is here's the Monte Carlo tree search agent playing uh, Space Invaders, and get have it coming up with an agent who can play Zelda or Space Invaders. That's not impressive. That's not interesting. That's not why I'm standing here. Um, that wouldn't get accepted to, uh, to as a paper or something. But the fact that the very, very same agent with absolutely no changes um, using the same interface plays both games um, without any retraining time, that's more like it. And it turns out that the variati variations of Monte Carlo Tree Search um, can play with some proficiency um, about half of the um, games we have in our, more than 100 games we have ours in a repository. Here's Boulder Dash. Any of you played Boulder Dash? A few people. It's a fantastic game from the 80s. It's been remade for a number of different platforms. Just to show that there are some more advanced games here. You run around, you, c you dig up the dirt. Um, if, you, um, if you dig away the dirt under a rock, it will fall and it could could be good or could be bad. You could sort of kill yourself with it if you want to, or if even if you don't want to. I mean, especially if you don't want to. Um, and uh, you have to collect 10 diamonds to be able to exit. You have evil creatures that try to um, eat you. Um, and this is my um, PhD student playing this, and it's not, he's thinking a lot, because it's actually tricky. It's both sort of, you know, a Twitch game and um, a puzzle game, and it interacts really, really well with Shutter. Um, a random agent obviously performs extremely badly, um, as you could imagine. Oops. And Monte Carlo Tree Search actually doesn't do excellent either, um, because it is um, you need a lot of long-term planning, and as you can see a goal, it does a couple of things which are um, pretty unexcusable. <sighs> so is this a way through general intelligence? Now honestly, if we have an agent who can play all the games in the general video game AI framework, I don't think that we solved AI then. But if we have that, I'd be really, really interested in figuring out um, what it is that actually works so well. And then uh, would we would be sort of modifying the framework so we could have more different games with different input and so on. We have a version of this. We don't have a forward model. We have planning time instead. And we're trying to use that for testing machine learning algorithms and so on. But the general idea I see is that you need to have general game playing capacities and you need to scale up bit by bit. Um, and eventually, I mean, games are lots of things. There's role playing games. There's like uh, all kinds of these text adventures. There are dating simulators. There's all kinds of weird games. The more of them you sort of include, um, the more of real um, human capacities you're testing. OK. So we've still been talking about playing games, even though they were video games, not board games. Um, but let's talk about other things, not playing games. You know, the other things, study them, explaining and teaching them building content for them, designing and developing them. One thing that actually people have been doing in game development is working on different forms of procedural content generation. So these are all, what you see here are commercial games of some historical significance that rely very, very, um, very much on procedural content generation. What you see here in the back is Elite, it's like a Space faring simulator game from the early 80s, um, where you move around from planet to planet and you um, trade goods, you fight space pirates, um, you fight the space police if you want to, or not, you know, you um, um, uh, travel between different star systems, um, <laughs> there are missions you do, and so on. And the amazing thing is that there are 4,096. <laughs> Um, star systems in one version of the game, but you could play the game on your Commodore 64, which has 64,000 bytes of memory. Like, how is that possible? That's like completely unreasonable. 
Well, the thing is that if you used, the game used its own um, source code as, um, as a random generator seed for a generator, so that whenever you enter the star system, that star system will generate it from scratch, including the placements of all the planets, all the sort of different other spaceships there, the what resources were available, what prices they had, um, what missions were available, all these things. The names of everything was generated. Apparently, they even printed out all possible names that the generator could, could come up with and to check that there was no sort of lewdness in it, um, which I think is really fascinating. Um, uh, Rogue is another good example. What we have brought up is the later day, um, uh, the Senate of Rogue. Rogue was a game that um, Michael Toy and Glenn Wickman in 1980 when they wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons on, on a computer, they made Rogue, but because they didn't have the disk space to store any of the adventures, and anyway, they wanted to play the game, so if they wrote the adventures themselves, it wouldn't be fun to play. So they wrote a generator for all the adventures that went into it. These games have influenced like countless other games, including big games, like the games in the Civilization series. When you think about it, Civilization, these epic strategy games, when you start playing it, you get a completely new world to play in, and that's like absolutely crucial to the game. If you knew what the world would look like, it wouldn't be the same game at all. It would be much, much more boring. Here we have Spelunky, um, which is uh, a huge indie hit, um, uh, where you're basically, um, it's something like Indiana Jones meets Super Mario Bros., but every time you play it, um, there's a new set of levels for you to explore. So this is really interesting, and this is really, really revolutionizing. It's revolutionized game development several times on, but I think you could do much more with it. There are much, much, many more things that don't, that don't exist. Say, there is no game where you can play, say, Grand Theft Auto, but then drive like five hours in that direction. And there would be a new um, city that's designed just for you with your sort of uh, needs and interests in taking in common. In this new city, you could enter every house, you could speak to everyone, there are new quests involving people you never heard of and clock turns you've never seen before and so on. And why doesn't this exist? I mean, it would obviously be great. I would try it. I mean, many other people would as well, I think. Um, so this is just because we don't have the technology yet. So one thing I've been working on is um, trying to make um, procedural content generation more powerful and more controllable um, in various ways. For example, by using evolutionary algorithms. So in this case, um, you can see the generation of levels or characters or whatever you want as a search problem. You have a space of possible levels or characters or items or something and you use artificial evolution to search this space for those that fulfill some sort of criteria. Um, what you need to deal with here is to come up with a way of representing this content so you can search it. But also, you need to have a good evaluation function, fitness function. How do you know if a level is good or a character is appealing or something? Which is a super hard problem because that basically requires you to have um, to encode a whole aesthetic sensibility into an algorithm that also needs to run fast. Um, so uh, we've been trying to do a, a number of different ones, those that involve humans, those that involve simulated gameplay, a couple of other ones. But let's get back to what I very often go, uh, will go back to, which is Super Mario Bros. Because Super Mario Bros. is, for various reasons, extremely overused in this field of research, as it's uh, there's too many papers using the Super Mario Bros. framework. But it's, it's very instructive. So just to show you what this can look like. So a PhD student of mine took all the original Super Mario Bros. levels and analyzed it down into a number of slices. So basically, this slice here is basically, or columns, whatever you want to call it. Um, here's slice one, here's slice one again, slice two, slice one again, slice three, and in this way, you can encode a Super Mario Bros. level as a um, simply um, a string. So each level is a string, and strings, as computer scientists, we love strings. 
springs are great. How do you know if they're good? Well, he also went in and looked at um, the design patterns um, and found 25 was maybe a somewhat arbitrary number of design patterns in Super Mario Bros. levels. This is, for example, a three-way design patterns. Any kind of structure where you could um, move below, in the middle of, or above something. Um, and there's like valleys between pipes is another design pattern, hordes of enemies, and so on. So these are things that can be things at a sort of medium level design, abstraction level, that can be detected. This whole language is inspired by architecture. Design patterns is a common mode of thinking in architecture. And, um, and we thought, wonder if we could bring this in here. What happens is you can very easily get levels that have a lot of local variation and a lot of local small problems. And this takes like way less than a second and you can get an infinite number of them. You can also by varying these objectives of the course of a level, get levels that vary in um, how complex they are. So you see the one up there has different kind of challenges and then it has like a long stretch with basically no challenges. So you get a sort of, sort of rhythmic variation in what types of challenges you have. And then you can keep doing this forever. Um, we've done, now I'm just basically sending um, into a couple of couple of different examples we've done in our lab recently. Um, um, in one example, we try these, um, we work on these bullet hell games, which are shooters where you have dodged an extreme amount of projectiles on the screen, but they still need to be possible. And these are hard to design because um, how do you design something that looks impossible but actually is possible to play? And we created a new, um, um, uh, a new sort of um, grammar-based language for such levels and used um, um, in a new um, algorithm, which is the um, variation of the map elites algorithm. It's a so-called quality diversity algorithm. It's essentially an evolutionary algorithm with some very nice ways of preserving diversity. And then you create things that, um, here we have um, the language to the side, and here we have the evil boss you need to fight. Um, you are a Laos, so you need to invade a toupee. It's a lousy game. Um, and Oh, so didn't we? Um, okay. Yes, and, and, and it has a simulator. So we test all of these, but look, by using vari letting various AI algorithms play them um, based on ASTAR or Monte Carlo tree search. And then we create, and, and, and then we want to find levels that look really hard and have various sort of strategies, but, but being playable by players of a particular difficulty or a particular skill level. And we have something else. And what you get here is that you can basically on demand create an infinite variety of levels that, th that have a particular kind of difficulty. So in this case, the two difficulty variables are strategic difficulty, how, m how much you need to plan ahead, and sort of um, tactical difficulty, whatever we call it, how much basically, how much you can get the movements exactly right, sort of the micro and the macro. Um, <coughs> Another question we posed ourselves was that, okay, sure, we can generate game, uh, games and game content using algorithms, but the world is full of content. There's so much information about things out in the world. Can we use that somehow? So we created, so one of my students, Gabriella Barros, her PhD thesis, which she recently defended, which is about making murder mysteries, or that was what it came out with. You take someone who's in Wikipedia, and uh, you kill that person. No, um, you enter the name of that person into the game, and then the game kills that person. I mean, in, inside the game, um, and creates a murder mystery, and basically finds a number of suspects and creates a whole graph and then you need to basically the um, the, um, the cover story for this essentially that you're um, a, uh, a detective of the detective for agency for time anom anomalies data it's very Star Trek-esque um, and you need to um, you need to go back in time 
to figure out what's wrong with a timeline. You need to figure out who is the other time traveler that has murdered someone and disturbed the timeline. And to do that, you need to find out who's lying. So you walk around. Here we can sort of solve the murder of Albert Einstein. Someone killed Albert Einstein. So we need to travel around the world and talk to various people um, and figuring out who is lying. And you do that by essentially cross-examining them about various things. And it lists various facts. We can get the flashlights. Very nice. And Alfred Kleiner, Wilhelm Wien, we can talk to him. And there's information about him and so on. It all comes from Wikipedia and OpenStreetMaps. So it's every, everything in the game is true, except the lies. Um, uh, and here is, this is like, so you meet various people and you need to talk to them. We had, in one version of the game where we investigated the murder of Britney Spears, um, the guilty person was Diana Ross. Um, we still haven't generated good motives for it, but um, it was her anyway. So, so, so this is like this is another line of the research, trying to see how we can sort of create complete games using um, uh, using the real world as an input. Now, coming up with good, um, coming up with algorithms to create g game content is, is great, but I don't think we can replace humans completely yet. Humans are still good at some things. Um, and so on yet another line of, re of research here is coming up, making tools that humans can make. You know, humans can use to, be, um, uh, to work together with algorithms to create games. So Sentient Sketchbook, um, was a project to create um, some to create a tool that generates somewhat abstract um, real-time strategy game maps that could then be exported to say StarCraft format or in what, whatever other formats you have. And the idea was that it would continuously give you information about how your design is doing. It would suggest things to you, and it would learn from your design style. Um, so it could serve you better, essentially. So it, it works on this level of like um, more um <coughs> abstract representation of a level that can then be um, uh, translated into detailed representations. Um, this is um, the system in action, I think. Yes, you draw a map and you um, choose to create spaces in various uh, places. Um, rhymes, uh, rhyming unintended, um, and you add resources. And in the meantime, these suggestions at the side of the screen are constantly created and updated. Um, these suggestions takes what you have right now um, uh, as a starting point and sees what it would be like if it was a little bit different or more balanced or less balanced or something. Um, and uh, they, that uses evolutionary algorithms and something called novelty search, which is a sort of an evolutionary algorithm without a fitness function. You get all this kind of feedback, like, hey, what are safe areas? Um, what are areas under control? And so on. Unused space that you can use. You get these new gauges that give you various metrics of the map. Um, and then you can use the suggestions to be like, hey, that was interesting. Let's see what, what it looks like. And every time you do that, the system updates its models of what kind of maps you'd like to design. Um, then try to figure out what, what, what you like and uses that to change how it produces suggestions. So it really tries to be attentive to your needs. Um, uh, yeah, and you, and you can basically look at these gauges and, 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 and see how they change when you, when you change something. And then you can export this to various ways. We have one version that creates roguelike dungeons, and the idea with this abstract format is that it can, it creates something, it captures something that is generic behind these different game designs. Final thing I'm showing you before before it's time to, to leave is um, yet another thing we've been working on: generating tutorials. So um, it's great if you can play a game as an AI. But can you explain to a human how to play a game? So again, we use this general video game AI framework where we now have a whole lot of different agents based on different methods that can play games. Um, 
how can we automatically generate tutorial for it? Um, and this, okay, this slide is old, current work in progress. We actually presented it at Foundation for Citizen Games a month ago and won a Best Paper Award for it, which we're very happy for, uh, um, especially as the system is actually still a work in progress, but hey. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is for the Zelda game you saw before. It generates, it analyzes the game, figures out what are the main things you can do, tries to play each different parts of the game, and figures out and gives you instructions for how to get points. And it has these animations that shows uh, like each step in the process, what, what kind of things get you points. How to lose. And it tells you if there are no more avatar sprites or um, uh, avatar sprites with key, then you will lose. If you collide with an enemy, then the avatar sprite will be destroyed. And it gives you, well, animations left, but it shows how, how you collide with an enemy, which you know, isn't that hard. But yeah, and how to win. It gives you the whole sequence of things you need to do to win. Um, using, giving you both sort of textual and animated instructions. Anyway, so to sum this up, what are we doing and why? Um, so what I'm, what I'm claiming is essentially video games are the perfect test bed for AI. I mean, the very cheap design to challenge the human mind and general video game playing is important, so you don't overfit. Um, you don't want to basically learn to solve a single problem. You want to learn to solve the problems in general, assuming you're interested in general intelligence. But also AI is the future of game design, because basically there's, there's a set of tools here which, we, which would will in the future basically be seen as silly to not use when designing and developing games. In, in particular, algorithms for automatic game testing, um, algorithms for generating content on their own or together with you, um, for generating tutorials, and so on. Lots of other sort of use cases. Um, as I said before, um, we have a problem science book. It's a pretty short, uh, short as well. It's like 170 pages or something coming out in November. Um, and we also, earlier this year, came out with a uh, much longer and more involved textbook, um, which is, well, it's much more technical. And this is available, both of these are available on Amazon and all these other sort of websites. But this book is also, you can also download a PDF for free um, on from gameaibook.org because we want you to read the book. We don't really care about money. If you want to give me money, you can give me money. That's great. Um, and we're running, for the first time this year, we ran this summer school on AI and games, and we'll, uh, it was in Hania Crete this year, and we're running it next year somewhere. An attractive location. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks.